Hello, everybody. Keith here with Rebel Civics. Welcome to today's show. I'm going to talk about the truth about the welfare clause. The Constitution's welfare clause is frequently used to claim the federal government can lawfully fund 80 plus social programs. The claim requires ignoring the Constitution's limit on the funding power of Congress. So I'm going to explain why the claim is false and it's absurd. Uh, why every federal welfare program is unconstitutional, and how nearly a trillion dollars a year in unlawful federal spending could be eliminated if Congress simply abided by the contractual legal requirements that they've sworn to uphold. Article 1, Section 8 does not allow any federal welfare programs, and I'll explain why. So I wrote an article. This was published, uh, it's been published in two places. It's going to be published on Unsafe Space later this week. Uh, one of the places that it was published is the um, Uncover DC article. And I'm going to talk about the article and read from it. And the show will be kind of a reading of it with a little more detail. And I'll show some of the links here. So the article uh, that was published on Uncover DC, it's got the same titles this episode. It's called The Truth About the Welfare Clause. So it started out with uh, three years ago, I did a letter to, letter to the editor to the Stuart Times in response to a, another letter I saw. Uh, the letter was called The U.S. Constitution Favors the Liberal Left. Um, the letter was kind of funny when I read it because it was so dead nuts wrong. Uh, I felt compelled to respond. So I wrote a letter in response. This article here and the show is a, a, a large expansion of, of the uh, original letter to the editor. And I'll read it just to show how uh, crazy some people that think the U.S. Constitution favors the liberal left uh, really are, how ignorant they are about the Constitution. So the letter claimed, to summarize it, that the federally funded social welfare programs are constitutional because the Constitution's preamble includes the phrase, quote, promote the general welfare. The letter claims that federal programs funding food stamps, unemployment insurance, public education and student loans are authorized by the preamble. Um, and this is, uh, I'm just going to read the letter. The constitutionality of Social Security, Affordable Health Care, Medicare, Medicaid, and other social programs such as nutrition assistance or SNAP food stamps, unemployment insurance, public education, student loan assistance, and environmental protection lies not so much in the Commerce Clause, as in the preambular assertion that the very purpose of constitutional government in the United States is to, quote, promote the general welfare. Again, I'm quoting this letter to the editor. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to explain why this is completely wrong. Um, but I just want to quote it as a lead in here um, to show what some people think. Uh, I'll just start with this one. The purpose of constitutional government in the United States is to promote the general welfare. Uh, that's just ludicrous. Like, that is not why the founders established our general government in Washington, D.C. Anyway, to go on quoting this uh, crazy leftist view letter, so-called conservative thinkers and organizations on the political right, such as the Heritage Foundation, the Federal Society, and American Legislation Exchange Council do not like to admit this truth. Um, I see in chat, uh, Lucy, yes. Will the post be on the channel later? Yes. All the links here. Uh, will be available on unsafespace.com uh, within a day or so after the uh, after this is up. So-called conservative thinkers and organizations, continuing from the letter, on the political right, such as the Heritage Foundation, Federal Society, and the American Legislative Exchange Council do not like to admit this constitutional truth. Constitutional truth is a is a funny line here. Again, from the letter, instead they use or misuse populist language pretending to save the best of these social programs by privatizing them or transferring them to the individual states, e.g. block grants. That's not private. Uh, if it's federally funded by a block grant, that's not private. Uh, populist in quotes, I don't know why you would quote that. Um, it is populist. Um, they're trying to save the best of these social programs. Best is a valued judgment. Um, best in whose eyes? Best in the people who get the hands out, handouts. Um, it's not best in the view of the people who have to pay for it by working and having their tax money stolen by the federal government to dole out the people who aren't working. 
Privatizing is also in quotes. That's another funny one. What do they mean by privatizing in quotes? I interpret because they think block grants are privatizing or a form of privatizing. Um, perhaps that it. But anyway, privatizing means the government stops doing it, right? Uh, and some private entity doesn't or doesn't do it. Anyway, I don't know why all those are all in quotes. At the same time, so-called quote, liberal thinkers and organizations on the political left often fail to make full use of the original language in the U.S. Constitution to publicly defend social welfare programs that serve the common good. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to go through what so-called liberal thinkers, how they make full use of the original language of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, spoiler alert, it's pretty funny. Needless to say, secretive conservative think groups will never publicly admit or sign on to their actual beliefs. Well, I'm not a conservative, so nor am I secret. I'm an unanonymous fact checker, so perhaps I uh, don't count in this. Um, I do publicly admit and sign on to my actual beliefs. That's what this show's about. But because I'm not a conservative, maybe they don't include me. But on rare occasions, the truth reaches the light of day. The funny part there is this guy's talking about himself with his letter, as in the tape recorded insider statements about makers versus takers or the freedom to accumulate wealth and the alleged criminal nature of taxing the rich to benefit the poor. I won't take the time to unpack all that, but uh, makers is in quotes. I guess that's because this person doesn't recognize that there are actually people who make are makers and there are people that are takers. The person who wrote this letter is a taker promoting takers. Um, apparently they don't even understand that the wealth that is taken has to come from somewhere. That's my guess. Uh, freedom is in quotes when you say freedom to accumulate wealth. I don't even want to break that one down. Freedom, of course, if you have freedom, if you have liberty to accumulate wealth, you're talking about the, the right, the inherent natural right to own your own body, which includes the right to own the output of your own labor. And that can accumulate wealth if you use your mind and your body in a way that does accumulate some wealth, which you do by producing a good or a service that someone else wants. This is pretty simple, folks. The alleged criminal nature of taxing the rich to benefit the poor. Uh, taxation is theft. Taxing the rich to benefit the poor is theft. That is criminal. It's also uh, it's criminal in several ways. First off, from the natural law, from the right to own your own body and the output of your labor, the right to private property. One form of proper, private property is the output of your labor. It could be your house. It could be money you make by providing a good or service. You have the right to own all of that, even if the federal government and the guy who wrote this article don't agree. It's part of the right to life. It's inherent in the entire concept of existence of a property right, the most important property, the number one property, and all the other ones flow from that is that you own yourself. You own your thoughts, you own your body, therefore you own the output of your labor, therefore taxation is theft. If it's not a voluntary exchange, uh, then it's theft. There's only two possibilities. What conservatives think privately and what they say publicly are two entirely different things for obvious reasons. Actually, I think I do agree with that, although probably not on this particular type of welfare. Uh, conservatives do, th I think some conservatives, I'm not going to group think all conservatives or all people who identify as conservatives and use a different definition of a conservative than I do. But anyway, what conservatives think privately and what they say publicly can be two entirely different things. For example, conservatives, the mainstream Washington, D.C. Republican conservatives do consider uh, war, uh, very important, right? They do consider funding Ukraine, very important. Uh, they consider um, corporate handouts to defense contractors and failing banks and constituent companies in certain business areas that give campaign donations to quote unquote conservative political leaders and candidates. Uh, they agree with funding that as a form of welfare, uh, but they don't say so publicly. So I, I will have to say, I guess I do. I do agree with that last sentence for a lot of the quote unquote conservative 
mainstream Republican politicians in Washington, D.C., currently in office or running for obvious, for obvious reasons. All right. So just to summarize this, what the guy who wrote this letter is saying is that the preamble authorizes all these handouts. Okay. Here's why that's wrong. So the preamble of the U.S. Constitution is a one-sentence introduction to the Constitution. It summarizes why the founders established the document, why they wrote it, why they sent it to the states. It's a, it's a one-sentence version of the purpose. It includes we the people of the United States in order to promote the general welfare. That's one of six reasons in the preamble listed for why the federal government was created by the states why the people in Philly who wrote the document established, quote, this constitution for the United States of America. The list of six ends with the key reason of securing liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. The number one reason, if you read the preamble, it's one sentence, doesn't take long to read. Uh, the number one reason is the last one, securing liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. To secure liberty is the legitimate, only legitimate form of a government. The only way a government can legitimately be formed is if the people voluntarily agree and create a government. The purpose of the government is to establish individual liberty and to protect it in the way that the people allocate authority to the government to do so. Uh, you can read uh, Frederick Bastiat's The Law. It's a great summary of, of that whole concept. Um, so the key reason is securing liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. Now, the number one reason, as claimed by the article, that the Constitution was established is not to provide social welfare programs. All right. So following the preamble, the U.S. Constitution contains seven articles referred to as Articles 1 through 7. Each article contains section. Each section contains clauses. I'm inserting this for people that don't understand the structure of the Constitution, which probably includes the guy who wrote that letter to the editor. Uh, it also seems to include a lot of uh, congressmen. Um, I don't think it includes a lot of the rebel civilians, ci civics listeners. So uh, that isn't necessarily for you guys. Uh, but this is a general article. Uh, hope it gets a lot of views. It got picked up by Citizens Free Press, which is cool. Uh, the uh, editor, the business manager of uh, Uncovered DC told me to expect 20,000 hits from that link. Um, so that's great. That's where this went. Uh, the preamble by itself confers no power. So the preamble is an introduction. It, it summarizes the purpose. Um, but by itself, there's no power. So the fact that it mentions general welfare as one of the purposes for establishing the Constitution does not authorize the federal government to use taxpayer money to provide social weather welfare benefits to an individual based on a particular situation. The reason is the preamble does not authorize the federal government the power to do anything. It's an intro to why it exists. All powers are expressly delegated within the articles. So to, to find a power of the federal government, you have to look in one of the seventh ar seven articles. You can't get it from the preamble. Uh, Carter's the one who pointed this out. Um, in contract law, the preamble is typically called the recitals. They're not legally enforceable. So the Constitution is a legal contract. Uh, it's called a compact because it's a legal contract between uh, governments. The governments are now the 50 states. The original one, there was 13 states. Um, the Constitution took effect when the ninth one ratified it, uh, per the Constitution. When nine ratified it, it takes effect. Um, that happened in June of 1788 when New Hampshire ratified it. So once one, once nine states ratified the proposed constitution that was sent out to the states on September 17th in 1787, when the ninth state ratified it, it took effect. And that's when the general government uh, that we call the federal government came into being. It was created at the time, on that day in June, 1788, when the when the ninth state ratified it. Eventually, the rest of the states, the rest of the 13, did ratify. Um, so there was uh, 13 original ratifier signatories to the uh, Constitution. As far as parties, it's a legal contract. It's called a compact. 
between government entities. The government entities, in the case of the U.S. Constitution, are the 13 states. And now it's generally considered the 50 states are contract are the uh, the contractors between them. Although that might be a fun show to argue that one. I happen to live into in a state that was uh, annexed by force into the United States, Florida. So, but I'll set that one aside for now. I just want to make the point that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, is a compact, which is a legal contract between government entities. In 1788, when it was established, there was 13 independent, sovereign states, nations, countries, whatever you want to call them, uh, 13 independent, sovereign states that contracted together to form the general government and assign a few limited powers to it that they hold. The states are the higher authority. The point being here is that the federal government or the general government is not a party to that contract. The original contract in 1788 has 13 parties. It's the 13 states. It's impossible to consider the federal government party to the contract because it didn't exist when it was written and ratified. It was created by the ratification of it. So it, it it's a cart before the horse problem. Like the federal government cannot be part of a contract when it was established by the passing of that contract. Anyway, the point here is that the preamble in typical contract law today and back then, uh, today we call it the recitals. I don't know what they call it. They called it a preamble then. Um, but today it's commonly called a recital and legal contract. It's not legally enforceable. If you attempt to argue something from the recitals or the preamble as a legal binding uh, part of the contract, you'll get laughed out of town. Uh, that's not what's uh, binding. What's binding for the Constitution is Article 1 through 7. Conclusion on this original letter, the letter to the editor is wrong. The preamble does not favor the liberal left. The purpose of the federal government is liberty, not social welfare. And the preamble does not authorize any federal programs at all, including welfare programs. Now, a more interesting argument about this is what's called the General Welfare Clause or the Welfare Clause. So in Article 1, Section 8, now that's the section of the Constitution that defines uh, what Congress is authorized to do, what, what powers were delegated by the states and the people to Congress, to the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, Art Article 1 covers Congress, how to how we pick representatives and senators, uh, what they're allowed to do, how they can be removed, all the processes for how that's organized, uh, how they can meet, like they meet on the second Tuesday in December. Back at the time, uh, I think that's what it is, something along that lines. Um, at the time, you know, every people were mostly farmers, businessmen, and they got together in Washington for a brief period, you know, maybe a month or whatever. Um, kind, typically, they said it for after the harvest was done, fall harvest, and they would meet and conduct the business of the general government. Uh, they didn't imagine that Congress would ever be a full-time job. Uh, that wasn't what they were thinking uh, when it was established. It's been expanded a bit from what the founders thought. Um, anyway, so we get the phrase general welfare again. Uh, welfare is capitalized just like it is in the preamble. Article 1, Section 8 is a list of all the powers that Congress has to, to fund and pass legislations and fund things, fund things. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 includes Congress to, shall have the power to, there's a list, but in the list is provide for the general welfare of the United States. So this is key, provide for the general welfare of the United States. And this clause is referred to as the Welfare Clause. So the Welfare Clause authorizes Congress to enact legislation of general benefit to these United States. The power is not about individual persons, nor is it about individual states. General welfare is general in nature. It's not for specific individuals in specific situations. Uh, here's Congress happily spending other people's money, trillions of dollars worth. They just passed one of the largest uh, NDAAs in, in history, the National Defense Authorization Fund. No, the, the largest one in history, excuse me, uh, almost $900 billion for more wars. They're engaging in uh, a dozen or so. And um, 
I did it. I did uh, an article show on that uh, recently. But anyway, here's a picture of Congress. Uh, they were all clapping to some big bill. Um, I got the picture from some news report. I've forgotten now what huge bill it was. It might have been the one that Trump signed, which is the biggest bill ever. He was proud to be president of the uh, and and be the one that signed the biggest bill in U.S. history. I checked. I think it's the biggest bill in Earth's history. So it's saying that the American empire is the uh, biggest empire in Earth's history so far. Uh, but I don't remember if that's exactly that bill. Um, and I, I can't tell for sure if there isn't if there's another country that's ever had a bill bigger than this. But I couldn't find one. I don't think there is. So I think Trump signed the biggest bill in history, unless Biden signed one since then. Um, they just passed another 1.8 trillion, so maybe that one's bigger. I don't know. We'll have to check on that. At the time, Trump's was the biggest in U.S. history. Back to the welfare clause. The welfare clause authorizes Congress to use money collected by the federal government to fund programs of general benefit only. That's why it's called general welfare. Each of the subsequent 16 clauses in Article 1, Section 8 authorizes Congress powers for specific, limited purposes. Each one begins with the word to, capital letters, T-O. All expenditures authorized by the welfare clause are limited to the 16 specifically listed power clauses. Uh, some examples are to establish post offices, to raise and support armies. That's the level of detail that is in there to coin money. Uh, I could read all 16. It doesn't take very long. But, and, but check out your constitution, Article 1, Section 8, and uh, read the list. That's everything. Congress is authorized to fund. Uh, it's not a long list, and you're probably going to recognize nearly everything in there. Uh, if it's not listed, Congress isn't supposed to do it. Uh, I have a comment here I'm just going to read. The federal government slowly uh, took power from states who agreed to surrender power. Today, the federal government has power over the states. The states chose to put on the shackles. Uh, that's true, Raphael. It's, it's the Voluntary acceptance by ratification of amendments started it, and later it turned into the states just being whores for money, you know, getting handouts from Congress and following the the rules that they subject to. So the three letter agencies send money to say schools, and the schools say, "All right, I have to do this, that, and the other thing to get this money." Um, basically, it's a it's a form of prostitution, and the way to fix this problem is to get our states to stand up and object to it. And they states do have the authority. Uh, as far as amendments, when you say that as far as formal agreements, um, the states have accepted constitutional amendments. Some examples that come to mind are the destruction of the Senate by switching it from a representative of the legislature of the states to popular election. Uh, with the 16th Amendment or 17th, I might be mixing the two up. Uh, 16th and 17th, one is income tax. Uh, the other is destruction of the Senate. There's a second one is that the states in 1913 accepted income tax. They ratified an amendment to establish individual income tax. And they had to do that because income tax is unconstitutional from the original constitution. The founders recognized and were adamant that the federal government could not take money from an individual via taxes that way. Um, all taxes had to be uniform throughout these United States. Uh, you can't tax an individual that's banned in the Constitution. So they had to do, they, they tried it. Lincoln tried it originally. Uh, Lincoln actually did it originally to help fund the, the War of Northern Aggression, or if you prefer, the uh, War for Southern Independence. Um, but that was declared unconstitutional pretty soon after the war. So that didn't last very long. Uh, they got attempted one other time in the late 1800s. I forget the details. Uh, that didn't go very far. Uh, and But by then, you know, by the turn of the century, 1900, it was generally accepted that they would have, that a constitutional amendment would be required to have income tax. And hence we got the income tax. And to Raphael's point, yep, the states accepted it. It's stupid. Uh, it's foolish. Uh, it's evil. But the point is valid. The states have accepted some and they've just gone along meekly with like many, many more. That's why, you know, the, the, the states accept the federal government dictating how much water is used by your toilet per flush. 
that's that's where we've gotten to with with the federal government running every details of our lives. So if your toilet doesn't flush well, it's Congress's fault. Blame Congress, blame the president, and blame your state primarily for letting them get away with it. We need states that can stand up. Anyway, Article 1, Section 8 ends with a clause to make all laws needed for the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution. This is not a blanket authorization for Congress to fund anything desirable by simply claiming its general welfare. That's a ludicrous position to take. Why would you list post offices and simultaneously think Congress can do whatever it wants? Uh, it's a silly thing. So the whole concept is the concept of expressly de delegated powers. So to claim the welfare clause in Article 1, Section 8 delegates a power outside those listed is to claim there is no point in the founders providing any specific powers in their list. The list exists because the authorized powers are limited to the list. The legal principle is the designation of one is the exclusion of the other when a numerated list is used in a legal contract. There's Latin for that, but uh, I tried pronouncing it a few times and uh, I would have to practice that. So I just wrote it in modern English, um, but it's a Latin legal term for that translates as the designation of one is the exclusion of the other. So a an enumerated list in a legal contract, which is what the Constitution is, is the exclusion of things not listed. That's what it means. And again, as I said earlier, the Constitution is a compact. That's a legal contract between the states that ratified it. The exclusion principle legally applies to that contract. Uh, this is a quote from a Michael Meharry, Constitution 101, the General Welfare Clause. Uh, Michael Meharry is, uh, he's a writer uh, with the 10th Amendment Center. Uh, he's a great guy. Read some of his stuff. Uh, we'll have the link for this in the uh, show notes on unsafespace.com. Mike Meharry wrote, the phrase simply means that any tax collected must be collected to the benefit of the United States as a whole not for partial, partial or sectional, i.e. special interest. Federal government may promote general welfare or common good, but it must do so within the scope of the powers delegated and without favoritism. What, what this says, uh, as I read it, is what I've said above here. And this is a great way to put it. Uh, shout out to Mike Meharry and uh, Michael Nolan of the 10th Amendment Center. Um, this, they can't use the, the general welfare concept to hand out money to an individual. It has to be for common good. Giving money to an individual, like they bring up SNAP program, food stamps. Giving food stamps to an individual is not general welfare. It's not common good. That's using taxpayer money, which was, which was taken, but the government has it from the taxpayers they have to use it legally. To use it legally, it has to be for general welfare or common good. So, for example, they can use taxpayer money to fund a building that Congress meets in. Uh, that's for the common good for those that still believe Congress is doing something good. Um, but conceptually, that's common good. Um, it must do so within the scope of the powers delegated. So, to understand if the general welfare can justify any federal social welfare program, you have to look through the list of Article 1, Section 8. If the program isn't there, it's not a power. It's unconstitutional. And to do so to an individual is favoritism. That's a great, great word. Now, here's a, here's a really good example of what it means. Alexander Hamilton was one of the biggest advocates of central government power, signed, signed a proposed constitution in September 1787. Hamilton wrote in Federalist 83, an, infirm a affirmative grant of special powers would be absurd as well as useless if a general authority was intended. So Alexander Hamilton proposed state governors be appointed by the president. He pushed for and he got the first central bank of the United States that created the first central banking failure in these United States. But even Hamilton agreed and wrote what is authorized by the Welfare Clause is strictly limited to the listed powers of Article 1, Section 8. Big Government Hamilton wrote, it's absurd to think otherwise. That's a quote. In a document justifying why New York should ratify the proposed Constitution. That's why Hamilton was writing. That's what he was speaking. He was a New York representative. He was trying to talk New York, and he, he was a major part of successfully getting a very skeptical 
New York state legislature to agree to ratify the constitution. They were concerned about the language in it. Some of the language in it would be abused in the future. And spoiler alert, they were correct. And this is New York at the time. New York at the time must have been quite different than New York today uh, because the New York legislature, one of the reasons they were reluctant to ratify the constitution was the general welfare clause. They thought it would be abused to hand out cronies handing out power to individuals and that it was too wide open. But big government Hamilton, he might have been the biggest of the big government guys at the time of the founding in Philadelphia. He said it would be absurd to think that general welfare statement, the general welfare clause could be used to do anything. It's confined to the list. So this last point here, keep in mind, New York joined the union believing the federal powers of the welfare clause were limited to the list. I've said it before on the show. I've written it in articles. You may have seen it before, but I look at this and in my opinion, the union would not have been formed without the legislatures of the of the states that ratifying it, believing that the federal government powers were strictly limited. It's not just the welfare clause. It's another example, the right to bear arms. Like if the states ever thought that the federal government would do anything in any manner to restrict any kind of arms from a knife through a cannon, the, the union would never have been formed. It wouldn't exist in this format. Uh, I mean, they had already kicked the king out. The Treaty of Paris was already signed, uh, which is a treaty between the 13 states and England, uh, by the way. Side point, but note as far as that the states were independent, sovereign countries, nations, states, whatever you want to call them. Founders called it states. Uh, in the Constitution or in the Declaration of Independence, they talk about the 13 states are independent from the state of England. Like that's what it says in declaration. England was a state, Virginia was a state, Massachusetts was a state. They were all at equivalent authority levels. If the 13 US states were not at that authority level, they did not have the authority to delegate any of their powers to the federal government. So anyway, New York joined the union as did the other 12 states, believing the federal powers of the welfare clause were limited to this list. And the biggest government guy of all, or one of them I'll say, Alexander Hamilton was the one who helped convince them of that. They got duped, by the way, but we can see that today. So the point is, why include a list if the intent of the welfare clause was unlimited? The list is not examples of possible powers. That's absurd, as Hamilton said. The delegates of the 13 independent states spent five months in Philadelphia during that hot summer in 1787, debating, refining, rewording, and finally agreeing on the proposed constitution. I went through this earlier on September 17th. They submitted it to the 13 states for ratification. Every word in it was carefully chosen. They defined the entire federal government in a document that takes one hour to read. They were quite careful about every word. Every word's intentional. Every omission is intentional. For them to list post offices and declare war as specifically delegated powers of Congress while simultaneously believing Congress can fund a billion dollars of whatever socially desirable program it can dream up is indeed absurd. Hamilton was right. It's ludicrous. Ludicrous is my word. Absurd is Alexander Hamilton's word. The founders spent a lot of their lives considering what is an appropriate and legitimate power to delegate to a general government and a union of sovereign states. They wrote it down. We can read it, so can Congress. I put a little message to Congress in this. It takes one hour to read your job description. Please take a one hour break from your campaign funding calls this afternoon and read it. This doesn't apply to every congressman. It, it probably only applies to 500 or so out of the 525. Uh, for example, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, Mike Lee, a few others. You're exempted um, from this. My request is not to you guys. If the founders believed the federal government should fund student loans and food for single moms with kids, they would have listed them as a specific power in Article 1, Section 8, back in 1787. There'd be a Federalist paper and or an anti-Federalist paper arguing for or against such powers. I put a little hint in the article. It would have been the latter arguing against. If 
the founders in Philadelphia had proposed food for single moms with kids and student loans as a power of Congress. There would have been an anti-federalist paper explaining why that was ridiculous. Uh, some of the states might have rejected the whole constitution for something like that. Uh, it was absurd for the biggest government, big government, biggest guy there, Hamilton. It certainly was absurd in James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin, Patrick Henry. No, no, that's that's not a, a legitimate power of Congress. Uh, the 13 legislatures would have each agreed these two were a matter for the federal government to act upon, or they would have rejected the proposal, or they would have reluctantly accepted the foolish mistake in order to get the union formed. Those are the three possibilities. Uh, some states might have reluctantly accepted it. Uh, so they did reluctantly accept a lot of compromise, the three-fifths compromise on slaves, for example. Um, on counting for representatives in Congress. There's so a lot of compromises in there. Um, so it's possible some of the states would have accepted this. I think it's far more likely that uh, several states would have rejected something just as ludicrous as SNAP program um, in the original Constitution. So no, Congress has no authority to do this. There's no amendment for this. But if they had done it, speculation or just uh, to, to think through the story of if, what if they did it, we would know why they accepted or objected in the ratifying documents. So the state ratifying documents would show arguments in it. The uh, notes from the, con from the convention in Philadelphia would have quotes and speeches and, you know, different word possibilities and debates about the particular words and exactly what was being proposed. There would probably be a Federalist document paper on it and an anti-Federalist paper arguing against it. The Federalist, of course, would have argued for it. The anti-Federalist would have argued against it. By the way, the anti-Federalists were wrong. We 200 years later, we can tell. I mean, the Federalists were wrong. Belay that last. The anti-Federalists were correct. Looking back from 200 years in hindsight, 200 plus, uh, it is actually the anti-federalists that were correct. One of the things was the welfare clause would be abused. Uh, that's part of why the three people who didn't sign the Constitution in the Constitutional Convention didn't sign it. <coughs> the welfare clause was one example of a reason they didn't want to hold it. They didn't want to sign it. Excuse me. <clears throat> So if they opposed, we would know why. We would have documents. We would we would have arguments for a future amendment that was needed to fix the 1787 Constitution's error. That's in the case for it being reluctantly accepted to expedite getting the union formed. Um, the Bill of Rights is in the same category. Some people argued against it. Some people argued for it. Uh, there's valid reasons both ways on that. I'm more in the camp of uh, they shouldn't have done it. Um, and it wasn't needed. The Bill of Rights doesn't actually do anything except provide some reminders. Um, I'll talk about that on some other show sometime. But the this would be in that same example as what happened with the Bill of Rights, where several of the states passed the Constitution under the stipulation that a Bill of Rights would be added later. And as soon as it was passed, they, they started on the Bill of Rights. Actually, the Bill of Rights was mostly written before that in the Virginia Declaration of Rights uh, before they even did the Constitution and is a modified version of it. Uh, there were 12, by the way, not 10. A uh, little, little interesting aside fact for those that uh, don't know, a little factoid. Uh, the Bill of Rights is actually 12. Uh, the, first, the first package of amendments that was submitted uh, by James Madison um, in order, in, in response to some of the states wanting a bill of rights before uh in in after they they accepted the constitution conditionally basically they signed it they joined the union the union was founded but they said that we want a bill of rights so there were 12 10 passed originally uh that's the ones we call the bill of rights one through ten uh the 11th was passed in the 1970s uh it sat there it and because it took until the 1970s for a sufficient number of states to ratify it that's kind of amusing and the uh, 12th one's still sitting out there waiting. It's uh, been ratified by some, but not enough to take effect. 
Uh, the one the one that was ratified in the 70s was a limit on Congress increasing its own income. Uh, if Congress decides to increase its income, it has to wait until the next cycle before it takes effect. That's a good one. So Congress isn't allowed to just up their salary and get an uh, increased paycheck the next week. They're really voting for the next Congress. I'm fine with that one. It's not one people talk about much. Anyway, the founders included a way to handle emissions via amendments. That's what the Bill of Rights is. And it's defined in Article 5. So they never claimed they were infallible, and they never claimed new unforeseen situations would not arise in the future. They provided a lawful way for the states to later assign the federal government a new power to fund student loans and food for single moms. So those programs could be constitutional, they could be legal, could be lawful for Congress to fund them. What it would take is a proposed amendment, which would require a debate, writing an amendment, um, maybe two, one for student loans and one for single moms, or maybe you could combine one amendment with a, another list. You could do like Article 1, Section 8, have a list of 10 more. So those two programs could could be legal right now. They could be lawful. The social welfare program would be constitutional, but only when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by convention in three-fourths thereof. Um, the uh, I was going to show you what the uh, Article Five is. Um, I have it up, had it up here, and oh, no, I had Article Six up. Never mind. Uh, Article Five lays out the process of how uh, amendments are done. There's two different ways. One is Congress debates and proposes an amendment, goes out to the states for ratification. The other way is the states get together in a convention. It's called a convention for proposing amendments. Uh, the, the common slang, kind of a slang term for that is Convention of States. Um, but the, in the Constitution, they call it a, a Convention for Proposing Amendments. Uh, that method has never been used. All 27 amendments that we currently have were the first method, which is where Congress drafts, debates, and makes a proposal, votes, makes a proposal. Um, the second method uh, could be handy to limit the federal government, although at this point it's just limiting, you know, trying to limit the, the ruler to follow a document that the ruler doesn't follow now anyway. It, it's a slave getting a slave master to promise to, to follow a letter that they write. Like slave master don't care. So I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not objecting to that as a solution. I'm um, try it. Somebody thinks it'll work, go for it. Um, but I'm not spending my time on that method. Um, either way, the founders point here is the founders pro provided a method for us to add things that are unconstitutional. And people that want food for single moms and student loans have a method. They could get their congressman to propose it. They could call for a meeting of states to propose it. They could send out the states. And if three quarters of the states ratified it, which is 38 right now, then it would exist legally and Congress could lawfully fund it. The problem for the liberal left, whatever you want to call that group, uh, none have ever been done. There aren't any. So Congress is still limited to the original list in the Constitution as ratified in 1788. There are no amendments that provide welfare programs. So legally, they're stuck with the list. So that's the question here. Does anyone really believe that the men who signed and ratified the Constitution had never heard of hungry kids in college and they simply forgot to list them? Those guys did know about hunger. They knew about education in 1787. There were plenty of hungry people in 1787, including hungry kids, uh, there were single moms. That stuff existed. That's This is not a new social problem. Uh, at the time, charity was done by locals, family, friends, neighbors, churches. That's pretty much the limit. Uh, when you have a system like that, there's a lot of checks, a lot of balances on who gets what you might call welfare. Uh, once it's controlled from a central government, a general government that's ruling over 330 odd million people, uh, it's pretty far disconnected from that original system where the church uh, would give some charity to someone who is down on down on their luck, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a single mom because the dad died, the provider died uh, with some kids, uh, but no, that wouldn't last very long. And the point of that would be to help someone get back on their feet 
just to just to bide them through this emergency that happened in their life. So to talk about this is not about is not against charity, um, but charity, legitimate charity, can only come from the individual using the individual's own property, own money, own property. Now you can an individual can give his own property, his or her own property to a group that where the uh, ideals and the actions of the charity are shared. So you can do charity that way. Congress can't do charity legally or morally. So all federally funded social welfare programs or are unconstitutional. Just to summarize, because nothing in the Constitution's preamble, nothing in the welfare clause of Article 1, and nothing in any of the other articles delegates Congress authority to fund any social welfare program for subsets of citizens in particular situations. That's student loans. That's aid to single moms with kids. Such funding is not the general welfare of the United States, as defined by the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. So every program is unlawful for violating the supreme law of the land in Article 6. So congressional legislation is only supreme if it follows the Constitution by being made in pursuance thereof. So that is the uh, one that I had up here. I was going to go through that whole one. So this is Article 6 of the Constitution. Uh, this is the one that has the what's called the Supremacy, Supremacy Clause. So I'll put a little tidbit in here. Here's the truth about the Supremacy Clause. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. Let me unpack that. So the Constitution in this clause is the supreme law of the land. The laws of the United States, which are made by the United States, their, their use of that term means they're talking about the general government, the federal government, Washington, D.C. So laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. What that means is that all legislation passed by Congress all actions of the executive branch, which includes the president and every three-letter agency, and every valid majority opinion of federal courts, including the Supreme Court, has to be made in pursuance of the Constitution. So if Congress can't point back to a particular listed item in Article 1, Section 8 to justify a welfare social program, then it's unconstitutional because it's not made in pursuance of the Constitution. That includes treaties. By the authority of the United States, they're referring to the delegated powers that the states assign to the general government or the federal government. That's the United States in this phrasing, that that's the supreme law of the land. Now, delegation is an assignment from a higher authority to a lower authority. That's what the states did. So, Federal welfare programs that are not in that list in Article 1, Section 8 are not under the authority of the United States. They're not made in pursuance of the Constitution. Those laws are no law at all, as Thomas Jefferson would have put it. Um, it's unlawful. So you can say you can use the term legal to mean, well, they passed legislation and a president signed it. OK, but the president violated his oath of office for signing it. The Senate and House of Representatives violated their oath to support and defend the Constitution by signing it. It's not under the delegated authority of the United States. It's not in pursuance of the Constitution. It's not legal. States are under no legal obligation to, to follow any of that. Uh, the rest of this just says, the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in this constitutional laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Uh, that just says that uh, there could be something uh, in the sections that provide things states aren't allowed to do. That's a very short list. The structure of the Constitution is a list of powers delegated to the federal government, to the general government. So they're specific. It's limited. It's specific. The Constitution also has a very short list of what states are not allowed to do as members of the union. Uh, for example, states are not allowed to make a treaty with another state, another country, another state. Same thing. Can't make a treaty with another state. Can't make it. And that is the same as making a treaty with another country. So California can't go and make a treaty with France, for example, on trade. 
Uh, the treaties on trade are negotiated by the president and they're ratified by the Senate. They're, they're approved by the Senate. The Senate is technically representing the states. So the Senate is supposed to be a body selected by the legislatures of the states and its position is supposed to be to represent the states in Washington, D.C. So the reason a president negotiates treaties and why the this uh, Article 6 clause has all treaties made uh, as far as pursuance, um, it's very difficult to send a group of representatives from 50 states. It's hard with 13, uh, but it'd be 50 now to, to negotiate with, say, Mexico on a free trade agreement. Um, that's one of the key jobs of the president is to go negotiate treaties. Uh, would include the NAFTA, North Atlantic, North America Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. So that's an example. So the president goes and negotiates it, but the president has no authority to approve it. The president doesn't approve a treaty uh, because the president doesn't have a legal authority to do that. Uh, he's just the guy that goes and meets and talks with them. Um, and he brings an entourage, of course, but... Um, the authority is the president to do the negotiation. The approval of the treaty is done by the Senate, and the Senate is supposed to represent the states. In the end, what's happening is the, the states have to approve together all treaties. It's not the president. It's not the House of Representatives. They're not even involved. Uh, it's, not, it's not the Supreme Court. They're not involved either. It's the body that represents the states in Washington is who approves treaties and the president just negotiates it. That's a little side thing there, but um, that's what they mean by all treaties represented. All right, back to the article. So um, where was I at here? Uh, every program is unlawful for not following the supreme law of the land in article six. Uh, as I went through, congressional legislation is only supreme if it follows the constitution by being made in pursuance thereof. So next, I'm going to talk about usurped powers. Um, if you don't know what that word is, I'll define it. When a federal government, when a federal welfare program isn't listed in Article 1, Section 8, it is unconstitutional, as I just went through in gory detail. The Tenth Amendment reminds us that the program is either reserved to the states respectively or to the people. 10A it's an abbreviation for Tenth Amendment reminds both Congress and us that the federal government has no powers expressly delegated to it. So I'm going to read the whole Tenth Amendment. This is on the Tenth Amendment Center website. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, this is a reminder. Um, this, my view is this is the most important of the Bill of Rights amendments, the, the, the first 10. Uh, this is the 10th. I think it's likely they put a 10th for reason. This kind of sums up the whole thing. So I'm going to break this one apart. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So um, that is a statement just reminding everyone, the federal government and the people, that the powers were delegated to the United States. By United States, again, they mean the federal government, the general government. So the states, the individual states together delegated certain powers to the federal government, to the United States, and they did it by the Constitution, by writing and ratifying it. There's a second part here, nor prohibited by it to the states. That is a statement on the few things that states as members of the union are not allowed to do under the Constitution. So a power that is prohibited by the Constitution to the states is not a state authority either. So the Tenth Amendment says if the Constitution doesn't delegate it to the federal government and it doesn't prohibit it to the states, then those powers are either reserved to the states or to the people. If it's reserved to the people, it's because it's not a matter for any government at all. If it's reserved to the states, then it's a power of the states. Welfare falls either into the states or to the people. I prefer to see entirely in the people. I don't mind a local government doing something. States is already a problem. Once a state gets into charity business, when you got a state like Florida with 22, 23 million people, um, it's a problem. 
So it's got to be done locally. It's better if it's done by the people. That's the 10th Amendment. Um, again, that is a final reminder of what the Constitution is about from the, from the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights is a list of reminders. I was getting in delegation. So that's a temporary assignment of authority from a higher power to lower power. If something's not specifically listed in the Constitution, there's no authorized federal power for it. By using reserved in a legal contract, the states retained that authority. All federal social welfare programs are either an individual state matter or reserved to the people for not being a legitimate government function at all. It's a quote from James Madison. Uh, thanks to Uncover DC for inserting this in my article. I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and slow encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. James Madison. That's a great, great quote. Madison is dead nuts right there. He nailed it. Um, that is actually what's happening. It's a frog boiling in water thing that the usurpations, the, the stealing, the grabbing, the stealing, the theft of state and people, people's power, power reserved to the states and people that is stolen by usurpation by the federal government has been gradual and mostly silent. Uh, there are people that are recognizing it. Uh, so it's not entirely silent. Uh, there are some people kicking and screaming about it. But for the most part, uh, it does seem to be silent. Um, it, for most Americans, they don't notice. And they're they're bribed by a little funding. You, know? you ask, you know, why do mice die in mouse traps? It's because they don't recognize why the cheese is free. Um, it kills them. That seems to work. Apparently, that works for the, the average American voter for a $1,200 stimulus check. Uh, they're just mice in a mousetrap. Too stupid, too, too ignorant, too stupid, too foolish, or simply not paying attention to why the cheese is free. Congress, the federal courts, including the Supreme Court and the executive branch, which includes the president and all of the three-letter agencies, have unconstitutionally stolen power reserved for either the states or the people. This action is referred to as an usurpation, where power is usurped by the federal government. I threw in uh, Merriam-Webster's definition here. It's not a word you hear in common English. Uh, Merriam-Webster defines usurp, uh, definition 1A, to seize and hold office, place, functions, powers, etc., to seize and hold in possession by force or without right. It's done by force. I don't, wouldn't use the term right as far as the federal government goes with an usurpation because the federal government has no rights. Only people have rights. Um, maybe I'm presenting a libertarian 101 thing here, but just keep in mind, uh, you know, natural rights are held by individuals, not by governments. Um, so I wouldn't use that without right. If I was helping them with the definition, I would have just said in possession by force. Um, it could be trickery could be bribery, but that's a form of force. So the form of, say, school funding, for example, uh, and welfare, for example, and student loans, for example. Uh, it is force. They're taking the money by force. I didn't voluntarily offer the federal government money for its 80 plus social welfare programs. Um, that's taken by force or threat of force. Um, a right of the government you know, what you might look at, what some people might call the right of a government is just an authority that is delegated, granted from individuals to a group. The ethical, moral, and legal obligations of the group or what they're limited to following can't be more than the moral power that the individuals had that delegated the power. So, for example, voting doesn't authorize murder ethically uh, or taxes. The only constitutional action Congress can take regarding an existing federal welfare program is to end all funding. The only constitutional action a president can take on a welfare program is to shut it down and fire every employee. The only constitutional action the Supreme Court can take regarding a federal welfare program is to offer up the majority opinion that every program is unconstitutional. So I got a list here. It's a handy list of 80, over 80 unconstitutional federal welfare programs 
the uh, link I have says that they total $839 billion. So you can almost round off to a trillion. They're getting close, but $839 billion in 80 plus programs. Every program violates the oath of office taken by every congressman, the president, and the SCOTUS jurist, every one of them. So if you want to cut down Washington, D.C.'s excessive pen spending down by 25 percent, just eliminate all these programs. Follow the Constitution, get the states, get the people. It's really the states that have to do it. Force Congress to follow the Constitution. That would require eliminating every one of these programs. I'd call that a good start, fixing D.C., one step in the right direction towards liberty. Um, here's the list if you want to know what they all are. Um, I got this list from a uh, little, little funny for extra amusement. Uh, this is for uh, federal ROFO programs for uh, poor single moms and stuff. It's from a single moms page. Um, so it's a list of 80 plus federal welfare programs. Uh, this is for people who want to get them, but it's a handy list. They call it a means tested welfare system consists of 80 plus federal programs providing cash, food, housing, medical care, social services, training, targeted education aid to poor and low income Americans. By means tested, they mean people who don't have means. So you have to fail the means test. That's what they mean. Um, so people with means are the ones that pay for this. They're the ones the money is taken from. Uh, the people without means are tested. You have to fail the test. Uh, and then you can get some of these programs. That's what they're based on. So as far as reward, uh, what you're doing is you're punishing the people who are successful, uh, have income, and you reward the people who can't or don't have income. And we see the effects today of where that goes. Uh, so the benefits are paid from this article. They're paid to those who work but earn too little. So earn too little is a subjective judgment call. Uh, in 1788, 1820, say Davy Crockett living in the remote forests of Tennessee and Kentucky, he probably earned too little by the definition of most people would use today, including the proponents of social welfare programs. Uh, but who defines earn too little and how does the government get authority to make sure people who earn too little, however you define that, earn enough? And and I may be ranting a bit here, but it's just silly. This whole concept, uh, I don't understand why, how somebody can write this without laughing to themselves. It's just a, a, it's a stick your hand out. I need more. I need more. I need more. Who gets to define how much? I don't know. I would love to have a, a Gulfstream jet that can fly to France. Like that would be cool. Um, I earn too little. So when is the government going to do something about that? The means tested welfare system consists of 80 plus low income programs providing blah, 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 blah. Uh, for example, they use SNAP uh, recipients to purchase more food. Um, yep. Yeah. And by the way, SNAP also, uh, I read an article today. I don't have the link handy, but SNAP also allows recipients to purchase the um, the selection of international liqueurs off Amazon. Uh, but we'll set that aside for now. SNAP allows all kinds of things. If you've ever been in a grocery store line behind somebody using food stamps, um, not to attack individuals who are probably just taking advantage of the situation they're presented with, um, I might say morally they shouldn't take it, but maybe they have hungry kids. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they lost their job for a legitimate reason. They have hungry kids. Uh, it doesn't appear to me that's the majority of cases, but you see people and I look at what they're buying. It's more often than not big bags of potato chips and, and all kinds of crap. Like I look at my, I'm a pescatarian, vegetarian, pescatarian, I eat fish. My girlfriend's gluten-free, super healthy diet. We look at our cart and we look at these people buying with food stamps and it's like, shake my head. Like, uh, how about some vegetables? They don't actually cost very much. Uh, cheaper than chocolate and potato chips, soda. Um, anyway, now I'm definitely ranting. So anyway, here's the list. Um, welfare programs. Uh, this is a list for people who want to, uh, find one that they can get some money for. That's what the list is for. Uh, I don't know if it's an exhaustive list. I'm not sure if the 
you know, 800 billion total is exactly right. I didn't go fact check back further than this. They're kind of proud of the number. So uh, I think it's right. Um, they should be embarrassed by it. But the fact that it's here makes me think, well, I'm not going to check it. Anyway, that's where the number just came from. Medicaid, uh, $485 billion. That's a quarter of a trillion. Um, you know, $4 trillion is what they spent last year. They're, they're going to spend a little more next year. But that's a, that's a I mean, half a trillion. That's half a trillion um, just in that. Child tax credit, I ICSI, I don't know what that is, 85. I'm just going to read through. SNAP, that's the, that's the um, food stamps thing. Supplementary social security income. So that's for people who don't make enough as far as uh, what the federal government's decision is. Housing assistance, Pell Grants, Child Nutrition, Head Start, Employment Training, WIC, Child Care, blah, 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 blah. Uh, here's the whole list. Temporary assistance for needy families, um, earned income tax credit, supplementary nutrition assistance program, school breakfasts, school lunch, special nutrition program for women, infants and children, WIC. That's what WIC is. Early reading first. I don't remember reading being in the list. Uh, I'm going to start skipping to get through these all. Mathematics, improving teacher quality. Now, there's a funny one. Do you think the federal government knows how to improve teacher quality? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Single family rural housing loans. I think it's cool that people can own their own home in rural neighborhoods. I used to own my own home in rural neighborhoods. Uh, and I did have a loan, but I didn't get it through the federal government. Uh, a bank thought I was a decent risk and they gave me a loan. Water and waste disposal for rural communities. Um, okay. I had water and waste disposal for my rural community. It was two holes in the ground in Sandy, New Jersey. They work fine. Um, supportive housing for person with disabilities. Now disabilities has a huge wide range now. Um, supplementary housing, homeless assistant grants. Hold on one second. I got to ban some troll here in chat. Sorry about the jerks in chat there. Um, public housing, Indian housing, block grants, Section 8 housing, neighborhood stabilization program, weatherization assistance program. Um, so for the people in the winter, they need a little weatherization. Well, the federal government will co cover that. I'm about halfway through the list. I better start going faster. Indian education. Eh, I mean, they screwed the Indians so bad. Some people claim that we have to educate them. The Indians that I see getting out of that are the ones that get away from the federal programs. Um, those are the Indian reservations that are successful. There's the ones that start businesses and, and are doing fine. They get away from the federal um, government income charity stream. And they happen to often have the advantage that they also can get away from a lot of the government taxation. Um, an Indian reservation can be if the Indians who live there want to do it, it's a huge free trade zone. They're not subject to a lot of the rules, um, including taxes. So that's a great place to start a business if you're an Indian, American, American Indian, Native American, whatever you want to call it. Work study, Pell Grants, 21st Century Community Learning Centers, um, Child Support Enforcement. Now, there you go. I, I wonder how many guns they have, how many rounds of nine millimeter child support enforcement happens, has um, temporary assistance for needy families, Head Start, foster care, adoption assistance, Chaffee foster care independence program. You know, that one's a terrible, evil one because every program that's named after a person, bad. Every time the federal government names a program after a person, they're, they're all bad. Maybe there's an exception to that. None come to mind. Legal services. Um, Senior Community Employment, Workforce Investment, Foster Grants, Job Course, Tax Credit, Older Americans Act Grants for Supportive Service Centers and Senior Centers. Uh, so I don't recall like a bingo game, paying for bingo games uh, to be in Article 1, Section 8. Maybe I missed that. Anyway, back to the article. I just thought I'd run through that list. I didn't read them all. Uh, it's ludicrous as... Um, as he said earlier, uh, Alexander Hamilton called it absurd. So I got a couple stories here I was going to go through, and then I'll close out. What are you up to? I'm past an hour just reading one article. I probably uh, went into more detail than I intended. Um, but anybody that's still with me, 
An early attempted at federal welfare is in an 1867 Harper's Magazine. Uh, it's about a proposal in Congress to give money to the widow of a military officer in the late 1820s. So two-term Dave, Congressman Davy Crockett, uh, he either stopped the bill on the House floor, um, he stopped the bill with his not yours to give speech. Uh, it's a great speech. I have the, uh, just, just for fun here, I fact-checked it. I am a non-anonymous fact-checker. Um, here's, the, here's the article. Uh, you can actually read it. You have to zoom in a little. I won't try to read it from this text, but this is a um, 1860-whatever. Um, it's a story called Davy Crockett's Electioneering Tour. It's a great story. I read it. Um, I like the story. I like his speech. Uh, it was used by Congressman, uh, by Senator Rand Paul in objecting to a Ukraine bill. Um, and Senator Rand Paul also put in an article called Not Yours to Give. Hey, Congress, American taxpayer dollars are not yours to give. Uh, Rand Paul is one of the handful of people that uh, are, are not in the uh, my recommendation to go read the Constitution. Um, anyway, uh, Rand, Rand Paul used this on the Senate floor. He was objecting to the $40 billion Ukraine spending package from May of 2022. I passed anyway, but he told the story. Uh, this is an article uh, based on his speech. And by the way, the speech is included in the article. You can listen to it. It's great. I listened to it twice when I was walking around doing some stuff. Um, yeah, Rand Paul makes some great points. Uh, Not Yours to Give is a story published in Harper's Magazine uh, in 1867, um, as, as I said. So Davy Crockett was a two-term congressman. Um, he was confronted with a bill to give money to a military officer. Uh, the speech is short. I'm going to read it. This is, again, this is Davy Crockett, reportedly, Davy Crockett addressing the House from the House floor on a uh, proposed welfare bill. Mr. Speaker, give me a cup of tea before I read this. I have as much respect for the memory of the deceased and as much sympathy for the sufferings of the living, if suffering there be, as any man in this house. But we must not permit our respect for the dead or our sympathy for the part of the living to lead us into an act of injustice to the balance of the living. We have the right as individuals to give away as much as our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no right to do appropriate a dollar of the public money. Davy Crockett continued, I am the poorest man on this floor. I cannot vote for this bill, but I will give one week's pay to the object. And if every member of Congress will do the same, it will amount to more than the bill asks. When Crockett finished, there was a silence and remarkably the bill failed. These are uh, this this is a transcribe of what Rand Paul said when later asked for an explanation, which was actually reading from the Harper's Magazine parts of it. Davy Crockett explained years later, several years ago, I was one evening standing on the steps of the Capitol with some other members of Congress and our attention was attracted by a great light over Georgetown. It was evidently a large fire. We jumped into the hack and drove as fast as we could. In spite of all that could be done, many houses were burned and many families made homeless. And besides, some of them had lost all but the clothes they had on. The weather was very cold. And when I saw so many women and children suffering, I felt that something ought to be done for them. The next morning, a bill was introduced appropriating 20,000 for the relief. We put aside all other businesses and rushed it through as soon, we, as soon as it could be done. Later in the year, Crockett was home in Tennessee, he ran into a constituent, Horatio Bruce, Bunce, Horatio Bunce. Crockett asked him for his vote, and he replied, you had better not waste your time or mine. I shall not vote for you again. Your vote last winter shows that you either have not capacity to understand the Constitution or that you're wanting in honesty and firmness to be guided by it, because the Constitution, to be worth anything, must be held sacredly, sacred and rigidly observed in all its provisions. The man who weeds, wields power and misinterprets it is more dangerous the more honest he is. I'm not going to read the rest of this, but he goes into the 20,000 and he asked Crockett if it was true. And he said, yes, it is true. I voted for it. Uh, he thought a great and rich country so far should give the insignificant sum. Bunce reports out why he was wrong, that he doesn't have the authority to give 20,000 any more than 20 million. And what ends up happening here, I won't read the rest of the story, but Horatio Bunce, Crockett, uh, 
he reports he's reporting to a a um harper's magazine reporter in 1867 so uh he obviously didn't record it, but, um, and he says in the article, this is how I remember it. So, um, Horatio Bunce convinces Congressman Davy Crockett, uh, that he was wrong to appropriate the 20,000 for the relief of the people that were made homeless by the fire in Washington, DC. And Crockett does an bounce about face. And when this, uh, the next term, uh, he does get voted in and Horatio Bunce calls for, uh, a gives him a chance to talk to the uh, local constituents and and um, supports his election. Davy Crockett gets back in and then he stops another welfare attempt with his not yours to give speech. Anyway, that's the story. It's an awesome story. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a link to a video of these early 1800s House Force speeches. Uh, I had a second example up there about firewood. Um, but I don't have a link to them, but the principle in both those examples is sound. And the examples are useful in understanding the limitations of congressional power. So there's no authority delegated to give away taxpayers' money or firewood of the other example to an individual citizen. So taxpayer money isn't for individuals. Taxpayer firewood is only for keeping Congress warm when in session. The uh, little meme in the corner here is a Davy Crockett quote. We have the right as individuals to give away as much of our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no right so to appropriate a dollar of the public money. Again, that's from the 1867 Harper's Magazine article. Um, San Senator Rand Paul used it um, in, his sp in his speech. Now, unfortunately, it didn't help with the cash and weapons being sent to fund the war in Ukraine, 40 billion this spring. Rand Paul said, yes, our national security is threatened, not by Russia's war against Ukraine, but by Congress's war in the American taxpayer. I will vote no. Great line, Rand. Unfortunately, the bill passed anyway. Few in Congress today care about the limits imposed by their job description in Article One of the Constitution. And Rand Paul makes it quite clear he's not one of those. He understands what it means. He objects. Uh, this is a great speech. Uh, go to the article. You can click the link and watch it. When the federal government favors certain individuals at the expense of others by pretending it is legally in the charity business, we get corruption and endless bickering over who gets the handouts. My conclusion here, no, the U.S. Constitution does not favor the progressive left on general welfare programs. It does exactly the opposite. However, the Constitution does favor the liberal left in that there's no restriction on a state peacefully leaving the union and forming an independent, politically left, socially progressive, liberal paradise with 80 plus social welfare programs. I welcome the experiment. Hello, and thanks for watching to everybody. Um, glad you can join us. And that's the show for today. Thanks for watching Rebel Civics. Uh, all the links that I went through will uh, show up in the unsafespace.com website under this show notes uh, within a day or so. Um, so, again, uh, I'll see you next time. And thanks for watching Rebel Civics. This production was made possible through the generous support of our members. To join our community, visit unsafespace.com. Unsafe Space is an online publication for individualists interested in subverting authoritarianism and ushering in the next enlightenment. For biting analysis and nourishing composition, or to sign up for our weekly news brief, The Abstract, visit unsafespace.com. Thanks for joining us today. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized for distribution on Apple devices. The following co-conspirators are hereby uninvited to Klaus Schwab's winter solstice party. Please be advised that CBS News has paused activity on unsafe space while it continues to assess security. 
central bank digital currency is a safe and secure way to protect you from Sam Bankman Freed. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't think about it, I mean, that's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is misinformation. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.